and a growing rule by math over medicine. This mindset can be seen in the trade-offs that now hamper clinical trials and drug development. FDA imposes increasingly onerous experiments to try to ferret out benefits from new drugs. And FDA reviewers want the results of clinical trials to insulate them from critics, critics who say they're not doing enough about drug safety. But the laborious trials that result come at a very big human cost. Higher degrees of statistical certainty under FDA's outdated way of designing drug trials require longer, larger, and increasingly impractical studies, especially when it comes to drugs targeted to unmet medical needs. Some promising therapies simply aren't being developed. Let me tell you one story of how this mindset impacts patients. Hunter syndrome is part of a family of related and extremely rare disorders. All are inherited. Each robs children of the ability to produce a crucial enzyme that's used by the body to break down certain sugar molecules found in the blood. Missing these enzymes, these molecules end up accumulating in places like the liver and the spleen and the joints with often painful and debilitating consequences. Before treatment came along, parents had to literally sit idly by and watch as these diseases d destroyed their children. But by the 1990s, drugs were developed that could function as replacements for the enzymes that were missing in these related disorders. These disorders were so bad and the drugs were so promising that the first of these medicines, a drug for Gaucher's disease called Ceridase, was approved on the basis of a very simple clinical trial that involved only a dozen patients. By 2004, FDA had approved enzyme replacements for four other conditions that were each very similar to Hunter syndrome, all with lysosomal storage diseases, where kids were born missing one of these crucial and related enzymes. It was understood that if you could replace the enzyme, these children were likely to derive a therapeutic benefit. But when an experimental enzyme for Hunter syndrome finally came along, a decade after that original drug was approved for Gaucher's disease, FDA's regulatory norms and FDA's regulatory culture had changed dramatically. In an effort to satisfy an increasingly demanding desire for statistical certainty, the FDA trial imposed extraordinary hardships on the children and their families. In order to approve the Hunter's drug, called Eloprase, FDA required that the trial enroll 96 patients. This was fully 20% of all the Americans afflicted with the disorder. And instead of testing the drug for six months, as had been done for every other drug, all of these enzyme replacements, FDA wanted a full year of clinical data, 52 weekly infusions in these kids. FDA also insisted that the kids be randomly assigned to receive either a drug or a placebo. There was no need to have a placebo in this clinical trial. The disease follows a very predictable pattern, and doctors already knew the normal decline these kids would have if they were left untreated. But leaving some kids untreated was basically leaving them to become disabled. Yet, including the placebo helped give the trial itself more statistical rigor for FDA. Finally, in past trials with all of these lysosomal disorder drugs, these enzyme replacements, drugs targeted to similar diseases, FDA asked companies to measure surrogate markers that the, the drug was having an impact on the disease, like the ability to shrink organs like the liver and the spleen. That was interpreted as proof that the drug was breaking down these sugar molecules and they weren't becoming deposited there. And this would mean that the enzyme replacement was working. By looking at these surrogate measures, which you could measure over a shorter period of time, it was a way to accelerate the development of the drug. But in the case of the Hunter's drug, Eloprase, FDA decided to test the ability of the children to walk and to breathe as the clinical outcome it wanted. FDA saw this as a more rigorous way to see if the drug was working, but it came with hard trade-offs. It made the trial much longer than it needed to be. You had to wait years for the kids to become disabled to see if the drug was having its impact and to measure the result. And it tested the boundaries of what was ethical. Yet this story is increasingly the norm when it comes to FDA review culture and has played out multiple times in recent years, so much so that observers who, who follow the FDA now believe that the Europeans have become more flexible when it comes to drugs targeted to Amer unmet medical needs than the Americans. The drug Yondolus for bone cancer, the drug Perfenidone for idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, the drug Tefamidus for familial amyloidosis, all rejected by FDA in recent years because, because the statistical results didn't meet the agency's requirements, all approved in Europe, all embraced by European regulators. To understand why FDA's caution is, at times, hazardous, 
you have to recognize FDA's growing resolve to make sure the trials supporting drug approval meet an arduous but increasingly outdated standard for proving efficacy. As my debate partner Peter Huber will show, this outdated model that FDA uses exacerbates these problems by tra making trials much more inefficient than they should be and allowing us to learn far less from the results than we otherwise can. Yet surveys of people with life-threatening disorders continue to show that patients want access to promising drugs sooner. They're willing to tolerate some risk. They're willing to tolerate the uncertainty. For patients with unmet medical needs, what kind of FDA do we want? An FDA that advances care? An FDA that gets new science to patients more quickly? What we can't have is an FDA that's ruled by statistics over medicine. We can't have an FDA that focuses on its present process rather than advancing patient care. Americans deserve a less cautious FDA and an FDA that actively embraces advances in science. Thank you. Thank you, Scott Gottlieb. Our motion is the FDA's caution is hazardous to our health. Our next debater is going to speak against this motion. Ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Avorn is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and chief of the Division of Pharmacoepidemiology and Pharmacoeconomics at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Avorn. Thank you very much. It is certainly the case that FDA, like any big organization, will occasionally not get things right. Um, and I don't know the uh, rare disease that uh, Dr. Gottlieb mentioned, but I think we can all agree that in this very difficult balancing act of <clears throat> is this drug going to help patients, is it going to perhaps make them sicker, uh, it is not an easy call. But I think the most important aspect of the question before us is, in general, do we want to have an FDA that is thinking very hard about risks and benefits and is requiring that the manufacturers who bring drugs to the FDA demonstrate that, in sum, the drug is going to be better for patients and not run the risk that we have all seen in recent years of a Vioxx or an Avandia that actually caused heart attacks and strokes uh, because those problems were not detected. Now, there are a number of myths that underlie the proposition that I think it's important to just uh, dismiss early on. One is that somehow FDA is the reason that we don't have more new drugs and that FDA is slower than other regulatory agencies. And in fact, these are questions that one can look at with real data, and the real data do not bear out the uh, assertion that Dr. Gottlieb is defending. There is a very high acceptance rate by FDA of new drugs. In an article in Forbes from last December, uh, it documented that 77% of drugs are approved the first time around, and a very high proportion of the ones where FDA says, please go back and find some more information out for us, are then approved the second time around. In uh, 2012, the FDA approved 39 new drugs, which was way higher than it has approved in any number of years for the last 16. It was a 16-year high. So FDA is indeed saying yes to drugs, and it is doing so at a rapid clip. That's the other myth that we need to um, disabuse ourselves of. Uh, in fact, the salaries of the FDA staff that review drugs are, for better or worse, half paid by the drug industry, which creates with it some deadlines that as a result of the so-called user fees, <clears throat> the FDA must have its deadlines met. And for a priority drug, which is an important new drug that brings something to the table that we don't already have, um, that is needed by patients, that deadline is six months. And in the last year, 33 or out of the 35 uh, drugs that were brought to FDA met their standard, whether it was six months for a priority review or 10 months for a standard review. You need a lot of time to be able to look at all the adverse effects that happen, what is the degree of benefit, and again, I'm sure that there are instances where it could have been done better, and there certainly are ways that, as was mentioned um, in the early uh, presentation by Mr. Rosencrantz, where we would like to be able to bring in genetics and bring in new molecular theories to approve drugs, and that's great, and FDA is trying very hard <clears throat> to move in that direction. But in fact, FDA is saying yes, most of the time it is approving drugs quickly, as per its requirements. And in a paper last year in the New England Journal of Medicine by Dr. Ross and colleagues from Yale, 
reasonable university, reasonable journal, they, they looked at whether or not the FDA was in fact slower than other regulatory agencies. And so they looked at the European Medicines Agency, which is the pan-European FDA equivalent, and Health Canada, which is the Canadian version of FDA. And it found that in fact review times in the US were shorter for FDA than they were for the Europeans and for the Canadians.